I don't know why, but at this time every year, I am so tired of my home and I just want to redesign and redecorate everything. So today I want to share five extreme room makeovers that I hope will inspire you to transform your own home in the new year. Okay, let's get started. This first makeover is a living room done in a boho aesthetic. As you enter the front door, there's a large closet to the right and then a very blank wall. On the wall opposite the front door is a sofa table. Next to that is a large opening to the eat-in kitchen. To the left of the front door is a comfy gray sectional, a large floor lamp in the corner, and a rattan and wicker coffee table. The walls had recently been painted gray, so rather than repainting everything, I decided to create an accent wall where the TV would be. To fill in the large expanse of wall behind the sofa, I decided to create some oversized wall art. My father-in-law saved these large canvases from the curb a while back, and I thought they would be perfect for some modern art. First, I spray painted them with sensor primer. When the primer was dry, I used a pencil to draw on a random design. Then I began filling in the shapes with craft acrylic paint. I chose colors that I was going to use throughout the room. An easy way to hang canvases is to draw a level line where you want the canvases to go and hammer in two nails several inches apart. Then just slip the wood frame over the nails. I'm no artist, but I think these turned out pretty good for free. I picked up this wood shelf at Goodwill for $3.99. I sanded it smooth using my Orbital Sander and 220 grit sandpaper. Then I used an old rag to apply some stain. I chose golden oak because I felt that was the color that was closest to the existing wood that was already in her home. To attach the console to the wall, I screwed two sturdy shelf brackets into the studs of the wall and then screwed the console into the brackets. Once I add baskets to the openings, you won't be able to see the brackets at all. I had some old floating shelves that I thought would add extra interest to this accent wall. To make sure that my shelves were level, I used a level on the wall and drew a straight line. Then I measured the distance between the two holes for the brackets and marked those on my straight line. To be able to hang the shelves where I wanted them, I was not able to screw into studs this time. So instead, I drilled holes and inserted anchors to secure my screws and brackets. I staged the shelves with a few of the homeowner's vases and some thrift store finds. I wanted to give her a little footstool, and I found this bright yellow one for $3 at Goodwill. I thought perhaps I could cover it with sisal rope. I thought you might be able to see the bright yellow showing through the rope, so I decided to cut it off. I marked the center spot on the top of the ottoman. I glued the end of the sisal rope to my center mark, and then I began wrapping the rope around itself and hot gluing it in place. I cut the top off of the yellow vinyl cover to put on the bottom of my ottoman, and I used spray adhesive to hold it in place. Once the rope was to the bottom edge of the ottoman, I went around it a couple more times to cover the edge of the yellow vinyl and make sure that it stayed in place. I used about 200 feet of sisal rope to cover this ottoman. When you walk in the door, the first thing that you see is this sofa table. 
I thought she needed something more substantial, perhaps something with closed storage, and I found this drop leaf secretary for $35. She had a large rectangular mirror that she wasn't using, and so I decided to hang it above the secretary using the French cleat that was attached to the back of the mirror. I styled the top of the desk with this thrifted concrete planter and things that she already owned. Originally, I was going to DIY a light fixture, but then I saw this Target light at Goodwill for only $32, and I knew she would love it. I made a quick trip to Dollar Tree to pick up some colorful succulents to add to the terrarium on the coffee table. I also grabbed an old woven purse and scarf of mine to add a little interest to the front of the secretary. By making budget-friendly choices, I made over this living room for under $300. The next room makeover is the kitchen in this same home. It was my goal in this makeover to completely transform this kitchen for under $200 and without painting the cabinets. As I cleaned her cabinets, I replaced her silver knobs with black ones that had once been in my kitchen. The black ones would coordinate better with the backsplash I was planning to install. One of the quickest ways to transform your kitchen is to change out your backsplash. The homeowner had already purchased several packages of these Dollar Tree tiles. I cut out the half blocks so that I could line up the pattern of the tiles. Then I just peeled off the backing and stuck it to the wall. I just continued this process to cover the area just behind the stove. The tile was not meant to be cut up, but I felt it would look really fake if I didn't do so. However, as a result, some of the tiles were no longer completely attached to the adhesive backing, so I reattached them using a good adhesive. For the rest of the backsplash, I used this peel and stick wallpaper, and it comes in rolls that are only 18 inches wide, which makes it a perfect size for applying between cabinets and countertops. Once I had the top edge of the wallpaper aligned with the cabinets, I smoothed out the wrinkles using a plastic paint guide. Once I was confident that I had all of the wrinkles and air bubbles removed, I used the paint guide and an X-Acto knife to cut off the excess wallpaper along the bottom and sides. I decided to run a bead of caulk where the wallpaper met the countertop just to make sure that the wallpaper didn't peel up over time. Changing out your backsplash can drastically change the look of your kitchen, much like painting your cabinets. The homeowner had also purchased some stickers that are intended to be used on 4x4 ceramic tiles, but I used them to dress up the front of her dishwasher. The homeowner had no kitchen table, but was hoping for something similar to this $1,000 table. To replicate it, I purchased several 8-foot long furring strips and cut them into 30-inch lengths. I also purchased an 18-inch wood round, and I used it as a pattern to trace around and cut out a second 18-inch circle from a scrap of plywood. I began attaching one end of the furring strips 
to the plywood circle and soon realized that it would be easier if I had a middle support. So I found an old spindle in my wood pile and cut it to length, and then I nailed it first to the plywood circle and then to the center of the wood round. Once I had done this, it was much easier to nail the furring strips to the wood rounds at the top and the bottom. When I was nearly done, I centered the wood round on a tabletop that I had removed from a $5 thrift store coffee table. I stained the furring strips to match the wood that was already in her home, and I painted the tabletop with the black paint that I had used on her living room wall. When the black paint was dry, I applied two coats of polyurethane to the tabletop to give it extra durability. I only spent $31 in supplies to build this table and $10 for the two bent wood chairs. The next update this kitchen needed was a new light fixture to go over the kitchen table. I switched off the circuit breaker to the kitchen lights and removed her old fixture. Then I hooked up an inexpensive light kit from Amazon and attached a simple pendant shade. To update the other light fixture, I removed the glass globe. Then I adjusted the light sockets so that they would support the crossbars on a pendant light shade that had once been in my kitchen. The previous owners had added this piece of plywood to a half wall that runs along the side of her refrigerator. To make it stand out, I painted it black and then hung a piece of white carved wall art of the homeowners. The next makeover is my master bedroom, done in an English cottage style. As you enter the room, there are two large closets with a built-in vanity in between. I've already removed some of the wall decor in preparation for painting, but as you can see, the room is just fine if you like a room that looks like everything was bought at home goods. To begin, I want to give this large wall art a more cottagey style. I painted over the pictures and the frames with a couple coats of ivory chalk paint. After applying the third coat of paint, I gently pressed IOD inlays into the paint. Then I lightly misted them with water and dabbed them gently with a soft cloth. After applying inlays over the entire piece of art, I let it dry for an hour. Then I remisted the inlays, waited 30 seconds, and then easily pulled them off. To add to their vintage appearance, I painted the frames with gold metallic paint. I love all the storage in our old dresser, but I hate the orange wood, so I'm going to paint it. Unfortunately, the drawers don't come out, so I removed the knobs and gave it a good cleaning with crud cutter gloss off. Then I began painting it with Rust-Oleum's Sensible Sage chalk paint. I rolled it on and I brushed it on. I left the screws for the knobs in their holes so that I would have something to grab onto to open and close the drawers while I painted. I applied three coats in all, and when the paint was dry, I lightly distressed the edges with 220 grit sandpaper. Then I applied a coat of clear wax to the entire piece. Next, I went over the dresser with some very watered down antiquing wax, wiping away most of it. I absolutely love how it turned out. I have always wanted to turn this 1960s vanity into a cute little window seat. There were only 
four screws holding the vanity in place, and they came out easily. After lowering it, I made sure that it was perfectly level and then screwed it back in to studs in the wall. For cottage appeal, I cut down some spindles from my garage and slid them under the front of the window seat to make it look like it was supported by legs. I used a little construction adhesive to hold it in place. I filled in the gap with caulk and then I painted the legs, the front of the window seat, and even the front of the laminate with the chiffon cream Rust-Oleum chalk paint. I used fabric and trim that I found at the thrift store to make a cushion and small curtain for the window seat, and I stuffed the cushion with a dog bed. I love antique Delft tiles, but they are way out of my price range, so I decided to make my own. I printed out images of some of my favorite Delft patterns and adhered them to 14 cent 4x4 ceramic tiles using Mod Podge. When the Mod Podge was dry, I sealed the tiles using a top coat of Mod Podge hard coat. Then I attached the tiles to my fake fireplace using Gorilla Hot glue sticks. I would have liked for the tiles to butt up against each other, but because I don't own a tile cutter, I had to spread them out evenly with gaps in between. Rather than use grout, I went around each tile with caulk in an almond color to better match the paint and the color of the tiles. I absolutely adore how this turned out. This is a complete transformation, and the tiles have been holding up just perfectly. When I started this makeover, I knew I wanted to create a lot of book storage, and I had some 1990s oak bookcases in the basement that I was just using for storage, Using a mallet and a small crowbar, I was able to remove all of the rounded trim. Then, using my miter saw, I cut four pieces of stop molding that I had purchased. I attached the molding with wood glue and small brad nails. This little electric stapler also shoots 5 8 inch brad nails, which is great for small jobs like this. I filled in all of the cracks with some caulk and then I cleaned the bookshelf really well with some liquid sandpaper. I painted the bookshelf with the same semi-gloss paint that I used on the fireplace and on the baseboards in my bedroom. I placed one bookcase on either side of the bed behind the nightstands. Then I constructed a simple cornice using a scrap piece of wood and some fabric from the thrift store to attach between the two bookcases. You might remember there is a small awkward window behind the headboard, which I think I have now successfully disguised with bookshelves, cornice, and curtains.
The next project is a basement family room that was in desperate need of a makeover. To begin, I needed to brighten up the space by painting the walls. You might be surprised to learn that white is not the best color for basements or other rooms with little natural light. A safer choice is a neutral with a hint of another color. Very light blues or greens will create both a bright and relaxing environment. Before I started painting, I removed all the plate covers, nails, and screws and filled any holes or cracks with spackle. I hate having to tape off areas before I start painting, so I think it's definitely worth it to invest in a good quality angled paintbrush. Notice how much brighter the walls seem with the very light blue paint compared to the original white paint. I decided to paint the wood trim and doors black because even freshly painted White woodwork can look dingy or dirty in a room with little natural light. I also freshened up this 1990s bookcase just by painting the outside edges and trim with a little black paint. One of the biggest expenses in any basement makeover is likely going to be the cost of new flooring, and it's not an easy decision because there are so many things to consider including the possibility of future water damage in your basement. This basement floor had some peel and stick tiles and some sheet vinyl that was starting to peel up. So I began to remove the sheet vinyl as best I could. The vinyl itself came up easily, but it left a layer of paper that was still mostly stuck to the concrete. I decided my best option was to go shopping for some peel and stick carpet tiles. And I was shocked to discover that there is such a thing as a floating carpet tile. This was perfect for my situation. These carpet tiles could go directly over the remaining vinyl tiles, paper, and glue still stuck to the basement floor that I had unnecessarily been scraping up for hours. Carpet tiles are not adhered to the floor in any manner. They come with squares that are sticky on one side only. You adhere these to the four corners of each carpet square so that each tile is connected to all of the other tiles, and that's what holds them in place. And because there's no adhesive on the back of the tiles, I was able to cut them with a sharp pair of regular scissors. This made it really easy to lay the carpet in spots like this little space between the stairs and the wall. Although carpet tiles are a little more expensive than broadloom carpet, I was able to save a lot of time and money on labor because I was able to install two rooms with carpet tiles in less than a day all by myself. Oddly enough, there was a pass-through window between the basement bedroom and family room. To fill this opening, I bought 12 inexpensive furring strips. I cut one strip to the height of the opening, and then I used that furring strip to measure and mark and cut the rest of the slats. I laid them out and measured them on my garage floor to make sure that I cut enough slats. To create a bar top, I bought a 2 by 8 by 10 piece of wood at Lowe's, and I had them cut it to length. I drilled several holes along the back edge of the piece of wood and then used two and a half inch wood screws to attach it to the piece of wood that was already there. I used a larger drill bit to countersink the holes and then I used a little bit of wood fill over the top of each of the screws before I painted the countertop. 
Next, I began attaching the furring strips along the back of the countertop using one furring strip as a spacer in between each of the slats. I used my nail gun attaching one nail to the top and bottom of each of the slats. To dress up the front edge of the counter, I attached a piece of trim that I had previously removed from the top portion of the window opening. I filled in all of the cracks with caulk before I painted the countertop using the same black paint that I had used on the other wood trim. I stained the wood slats to match the other natural wood in the basement. To create privacy for the bedroom, I also purchased a large piece of hardboard at Lowe's and had them cut it to the size of the window opening. I painted it black and attached it to the back side of the opening using a few nails. The next makeover is the bedroom in this same basement. The bedroom is approximately 10 feet by 12 feet and has built-in cabinets along the left-hand wall. There is also a large carpeted cubby underneath the stairs. There is a 6 foot wide window along the back wall. The right-hand wall is bare except for a couple of hanging shelves. To begin, I took down the shelves and filled all the cracks and holes in the walls and painted them with the same light blue paint as I had used in the family room. Both the baseboards and the window trim were in rough shape. To remain consistent with the wood trim in the family room, I painted the wood in the bedroom with the same black paint. But now, what to do about those built-in cabinets? I began removing the carpet tiles from the walls and the ceiling. The wood slats in between removed easily, but the carpet tiles themselves were glued and not easy to pry off. So I decided to remove only the ones along the front of the cubby. I slid in a cheap wood dresser that fit perfectly after I cut the trim off one side. I cut a couple small pieces of scrap wood and wedged them in between the dresser and the wall on the right hand side. And I cut a furring strip to fill the gap in front of the dresser. To fill the hole above the dresser, I cut a couple pieces of hardboard left over from the pass through window. I cut one piece to cover the ceiling area, and I used a nail gun to nail it in place. I covered the hardboard and the paneling with peel-and-stick grass cloth wallpaper. I attached a furring strip to the paneling on each side of the dresser. I lined it up with the back edge of the dresser and nailed it in place using my nail gun. Then I inserted another piece of hardboard, pressing it up against the furring strips and nailing it in place. I cut a couple small strips of the wallpaper and adhered them over the seam between the two pieces of hardboard, and then applied the wallpaper to the remaining piece of hardboard. I added a furring strip along the back of the dresser and along the right hand side to fill in the gaps between the dresser and the walls. Then I painted both the dresser and the built in cabinets with the same black paint that I had used on the baseboards and trim. I found some brushed gold handles on clearance at Menards for just $2 each and I used a piece of painter's tape to make sure that I drilled the holes in the precise location that I wanted. 
I still needed to figure out what to do with the open space underneath the built-in cabinets. So I decided to create some shoe storage using wood that I already had in my garage. This design would allow me to easily cut the wood with a circular saw and join the pieces together using wood glue and a nail gun. After I attached the two end pieces to the top piece, I measured the wood as I went along, knowing that if I cut everything beforehand, that I would run into problems. And it was the right decision because after I added all of the vertical pieces, the boxes were not all exactly the same size. So each horizontal piece was measured and cut to fit that exact box. Once it was completely assembled, I pushed it under the built-in cabinets and luckily it was a perfect fit. Since I still had a lot of furring strip scraps left from the pass-through window project, I decided to cut some pieces to fit along the front edges of the shoe storage. This would dress up the cheap pine wood and make it look thicker than it actually was. I intentionally left the area under the dresser open so that all that storage area under the stairs could easily be accessed. I still need to give the shoe storage area a second coat of black paint, but overall I'm very pleased with how this wall of built-ins turned out. The only light in the room was a single recessed light in the ceiling. So I purchased a recessed light converter so that I could install a traditional ceiling fixture. I attached a beaded light fixture that I found at the Amazon bins for just $1. Once I took the shelves down from the right-hand wall, it was looking pretty bare. So to add interest to the headboard wall, I purchased a 1x4x12 piece of lumber. I cut it to fit between the two walls, and then I cut that scrap of wood into three pieces for brackets to hold it. I attached one scrap of wood to each of the side walls, and one scrap of wood in the center of the ledge. Thank you so much for watching today and make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss the all new room makeovers I have planned in the upcoming weeks.